In this episode, I'm going to talk about the Aria Sebaldina, the sixth one of the Hexacodum Apollinis by Pachelbel. I will talk a little bit about movement and also about instrument choice. That's coming up right after this. Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of Afterthoughts. My name is Wim Winters and tonight I have recorded this beautiful aria Sebaldina of Pachelbel. So and also thank you for, to Neil for pointing me on the fact that the pronunciation of Pachelbel is actually Pachelbel and not Pachelbel like I was used to do and apparently many people. So, this is a set of variations. Last one of the Hexacortum Apollinis, which Pachelbel wrote, Pachelbel wrote in 1699. I'm playing from the Berenreiter Ausgabe. And there are six sets of variations uh, together, which were published by Pachelbel. And this is the last one. I have recorded number two, which I can link in the description box or here in the video in the info card so you can click on that. I have recorded also another Pachel Bell Giacona but that's from another cycle. So and in this episode I want to touch two topics. First on the movement. How do you, why do I feel that this movement, this tempo is continuing and how do I do that? And secondly about the instrument choice and I will warn you it will be a first um, thought that I have playing this music of Pachelbel not covered by any source thought. So that might be very interesting, just out of my instinct, so to say. But that's for, the, for later. I hope that I play this piece in one movement, in one tempo. I think that's actually meant uh, by Pachelbel, by all these kinds of suites, that you find a kind of coherence in tempo. For me, the effect of this, the F minor effect, is really very serious and very sad, actually. So the movement of this three-quarter piece is a very slow progression, very slow, and maybe in the late 18th century, Pachelbel would have uh, written Andante Manantropo, maybe. Very strong first beat. So that's quite hard to continue because the effect falls, actually, the effect disappears when you change that movement. very strong first pull. So difficult now for variation one to keep it because suddenly there are 16 notes and that's difficult for everybody. So don't think if you play and you feel that you're uh, accelerating, just take your metronome and check it out. I sometimes do it as well. So that, that remains difficult. And the only thing that you can gain by playing a lot is that you gain experience. So if you... You feel the same movement. And this feeling is what ties this complete piece as to a whole. With your right accent, because you have to emphasize this first beat. Yum. Of course, 
course, if you would take a metronome just to check your tempo, you will see that the metronome, of course, is very machine-like. It's always very steady. It's not interesting, actually. It's just to check. So let you, I allow myself to just give a little bit. It's not tempo rebato, but just a little bit of freedom. And then here, third variation. That's the feeling I have that if you have this movement that is so relaxing that it doesn't matter if you stay within that movement and give the strong beats the emphasis you need then actually the music is very easy to play but because the details of course make them beautiful in the sense that they fit together and all fragments are clear articulations is exactly what you want etc etc but that basic movement feeling of that should be there. If that isn't there, then the rest doesn't matter. But if that is there, then the rest does matter, of course. But it's just adding something on the cage. I don't know how that is in English. variation is 9-8 which I play here actually in the same tempo I try to do it I know in the Bach we have spoken about the 12-8 which is the fastest Eight note bar structure, which is if it equals four four, but here the nine eight, I think you should keep the same tempo and then <laughs> difficult to stay within the tempo here. We are pa -pa -pa -pa. I practice that actually by shifting or by playing the different variations one to another and not always in the same order and not always complete so if I were to check the tempo of the eight variations feels natural after a while then this feeling so to say sinks into your body into your blood and then you can trust on your instinct that when you're playing you will follow the movement unless the five-year-old girl is dancing next to you but I think it was rather close but rather close is not enough if you have this really nice feeling of a three-quarter movement then just Diversif diversify a little bit or differ a little bit from that can give a, a feeling of not very right, you know what I mean? It should then be really spot on 
and then it works. So second point regarding instrument choice. I was telling in the beginning of this episode that I was going to say something that I could not relate to sources with just my instinct by playing this music. You see on the back this little instrument on top of uh, the big clavichord that is Joris Potvlieg's own instrument. I will bring it back next week. Um, that little instrument, we've talked about that and we're going to make a beautiful recording on that at a, in a beautiful location. I'm not going to tell you why and how because it's not settled yet, but that's the little instrument uh, built by Christopher Clark. There's a video on the channel already and we will go much more in detail on that. But that's a triple fretted clavichord, copy of uh, a clavichord that is present in the Russell Collection in Edinburgh. And that was the kind of instrument that I related to this even late 70th century music. And I must say, if you play the first aria, aria of aria, of this Hexacordum Apollinis, which is written in 606099. I shouldn't play it completely because it's so beautiful. Then that, that first aria, that is playable on that clavichord and it's triple flat fretted, so that's not a big deal. You have to know where the, the uh, um, uh, which keys have uh, come and share the same string. So sometimes you have to release a note, but that's might be that's different from instrument to instrument. So that's something that's not too difficult. And also the reason that it's fretted, the only difficulty to that is that you have to release the keys very properly, properly, which is actually not too difficult. If you cannot manage that, you cannot play on this instrument. This is much harder. It's actually, those instruments are quite easy to play. That's, that's my, uh, how I see it, but they're less suited for really virtuosic music, which is, a kind of Pachelbel because we can look to that as music that's not too difficult because we know Bach and we know later music but actually in that time was quite something and playing it on such a large unfretted clavichord that goes so incredibly well and also the F minor yeah, because throughout the sixth arias Pachelbel is making a kind of progress. I think you only miss one note in the short octave for the first aria, but going to the second one and the third one, you miss more and more notes. So it's making a kind of progression towards an, suddenly F minor. But of course also um, B flat minor, which requires a temperament that allows these keys. And on temperament, we will make a short series of videos, we have to go through that. It's sensitive, but it's important. So I wouldn't be able to tune that instrument, I think, in a key, in a way that would allow me to play this aria in a kind of temperament that allows these keys. And having said that, what's the option then? Playing it on harpsichord, evidently, or playing it on these large unfretted clavichords. And then is the question, were they available by Pachelbel or not? Not that we should care in the sense that if it sounds beautiful, it's okay. But I think if we want to be in this kind of hip movement, historically informed performance practice, whatever informed is and whatever historically is, it's our view, then we should think as musicians also, were these instruments available to Pachelbel, yes or no? And since I feel that this music goes so well on the clavichord and it kind of requires the, the sensitivities and the palette of colors and, uh, and, and things like that, that the harpsichord cannot offer you. Of course, you can play it beautifully on the harpsichord. It's not, I don't want to touch any um, uh, polemic uh, uh, discussion on that. That's, that. that's not what I'm trying to do far from. But the difference between clavichord and harpsichord is that I see the, the harpsichord more in, in the 17th century music, and I'm talking about the German areas, the clavichord is making, and certainly these instruments are making openings so much 
for expression and micro expression that they were looking for in the 18th century that this music fits into that pattern so well that I just was wondering if Pachel Bell could not have known the Unfretted Clavichord already because I think that's what you need to play this music on. Uh, so a non-fretted instrument, so the harpsichord obviously, but it, maybe even the clavichord. I understood from Joris Potflieger, who is about to publish a large article in Clavichord International on the on G.S. Bach and the clavichord. That's really interesting to check out. Um, that the first documented unfretted clavichords actually were documented in the southern of Germany in this period. So that was kind of yeah, not that I found proof in that, but such moments, of course, are very nice to experience that what you feel instinctively is being backed a little bit by some sources. Not to say that Pachelbel wrote this music for Clevercourt, but I'm just sharing with you what my impression is, what my experience is. So I'm not trying to prove anything, but just sharing that with you. And that might be interesting, just to share instincts, uh, um, experiences that one has as a player by playing uh, on instruments and working with music. And if things can be related to sources, that's fine. But sometimes and most of the time, it's only an inter interpretation, interpretation of, of those sources. And we shouldn't forget that that's important as well. And again, not to say that what I was saying is important, but you get my point. It's sometimes difficult for me in English to pronounce, to ex express really in detail what I want to say, but I hope you get my point. So maybe the unfretted clavichords were there with Pachelbel, and maybe Pachelbel was playing on it. Christoph Bach, Bach's older, elder brother, studied there, and who knows what these relationships were. And um, Again, Joris Potflieger's article will go in detail, great detail on, on that, and it was an eye-opener to me. Anyway, thank you for watching and thank you for subscribing to the channel. As always, liking and sharing this video with your friends, that's very important for the YouTube algorithms. Rhythms, and that's the final word of this afterthoughts. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye.